Hello, and welcome to another edition of Facebook Live from the Office of Admission here at Texas Christian University. My name is Heath Einstein, and I have the great pleasure of serving TCU as Dean of Admission, and we have a wonderful program, again, scheduled for tonight or today or tomorrow, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. And it's wonderful to see how many people are joining and from where you're coming. Um, so hello to Sophia in Minnesota and Clay in North Carolina and Kristen from my home state of California. Um, Dr. Riddle right here in Fort Worth. So good to see you. So lots of folks joining us today. Um, and we start all of our programs with a land acknowledgement, whether on campus or virtually. Um, and so we will do that now. We respectfully acknowledge all Native peoples who have been here since time immemorial. And we are especially grateful to the Wichita and affiliated tribes upon whose ancestral homeland TCU is located. So the next time you're on campus, I encourage you to check out the monument that's right between Reed Hall and Jarvis Hall, centrally located on campus. Um, we were talking just before coming on air tonight. Um, I guess this isn't really on air, but we, we treat this like it's a TV show or a radio broadcast. Uh, and we figured that we have done now, oh gosh, 24, or 25 of these Facebook Live events now since we started over two years ago. And they've become quite popular and we're really ecstatic about them. So if you have been with us before, you know the format. It is unscripted. We have a general topic that we cover and uh, we'll get into that. But if there's anything else that comes up about the admission process or anything you wanna know about TCU, we're here to help you uh, navigate that. Um, and we uh, want you to ask a lot of questions. So go ahead and pop those questions into the comments. You can start doing that now. We will try to get to as many of those as we can. The topic tonight is the College of Science and Engineering. But again, if you wanna know about other aspects of the TCU admission process, that is fine. We are scheduled to go for about an hour, but if it takes less time than that, that's okay. Um, we will be here um, to answer as many of those questions that we can get to. I want to thank a couple of individuals who are not appearing on the screen at the moment, but they are no less relevant or important to our being able to, uh, to conduct this program. So Rob Berline from the alumni office at TCU, who's been with us for every one of our programs, um, and Liz Rainwater, who's Director of Admission Marketing and Communication. Um, I just want to publicly acknowledge them for all the work that they're doing this evening. Um, this is, as you know, if you have joined us recently or if you're seeing messages that we put out on social media, this is an award-winning program. And wow. here is, yeah, here is the trophy <laughs> that we got. This is pretty exciting. 38th annual EduAd Awards gold winner, Facebook Live. Um, so they, they, they hand out these little trophies, which are really cool. And we got one. It says presented to Health Einstein, not Heath Einstein. It says Health Einstein. Uh, now, just want to, I want to clear, I don't want to be throwing shade to anybody on our staff. We put in the name spelled correctly. They gave it to us incorrectly. So, uh, of course, we went back to them and said, can you give us the nameplate spelled correctly? Which they did. And here's the replacement one. So I'm just curious how you all feel. Should we use the original sort of as a gag? That's not kind of funny. Or should we put my name spelled correctly? So if you have an opinion about this and want to throw it in the <laughs> chat, we'll take that as well. Um, and we'll see how we'll, we'll tally the votes afterwards and see what people think. Anyway, so that's pretty cool. OK, uh, I want to throw it over to my guest, Dr. Matt Chumchall, um, who is a dear colleague and has been a, a, a friend of me and, and of the Office of Admission for a long time. Uh, Dr. Chumchal is the director of the Pre-Health Professions Institute. So if you think about pre-med, pre-vet, pre-dental, anything that's pre and then some health science that follows it, um, that would fall under the umbrella of the Pre-Health Professions Institute, which Matt directs. Um, he's an ecologist by training um, whose research primarily focuses on mercury contaminations in the environment which sounds really, really interesting. So Matt, um, welcome and uh, love for you to just, you know, talk about the work that you're doing uh, over in the College of Science and Engineering for a couple minutes. 
Yeah, thanks, Heath. Um, well, it's great to be here. Great to represent uh, the college. Uh, we Within the college, we have 11 departments. Uh, they're very diverse, ranging from biology to psychology to nutritional sciences and, and several others. Um, and there are 39 different degree programs that students can, can uh, choose from within the college. And I think uh, though what really unites all of these uh, departments that are, again, quite different in, in their focus is an interest in uh, our undergraduate students. And I think it's something that's really special about TCU in general, but, but definitely this college in that students have the opportunity to, to you know, take classes um, and uh, engage in fa with faculty in a way that would be more common at a smaller university but they get then all the benefit of um, access to cutting edge research equipment that would be more common at a large university, larger university. So they kind of get the best of, of both worlds. Um, and then my, my pre-health hat, I think you described it really well. I, the only thing I would add is uh, really the, the areas of, of uh, pre-health that we focus on are those where students are gonna take a lot of science prerequisites. And that's really why uh, our institute is housed within the College of, of Science and Engineering. And if I had to just, just tell you one thing that I think really sets our group apart um, and really has helped us be successful as we guide students into applying to, uh, to professional school is, is the access they get to our advisors. We have uh, over 20 uh, faculty, staff, advisors, they're available five days a week without an appointment for students to drop in and get help. So we, we really focus on doing everything we can to help students uh, prepare to apply to professional school, which, which can really be a three, four year or longer process. And uh, that help, I'd, I'd also say, doesn't stop once they graduate. We continue to engage with our alumni. Um, so and anyway, that's a little bit about, uh, about us and uh, glad to be here. Yeah, Matt, I, I want to pick up right there because um, that's something that has always struck me about our faculty. Um, it doesn't matter if it's faculty who deal directly with students who are applying to medical school, other faculty um, outside of that realm um, in the College of Science and Engineering, or frankly, faculty in every corner of the university. It's that commitment to mentorship and, um, and building a really close relationship with students that, as you described, more typically occurs at schools that are smaller than we are. Um, that to me is really the secret sauce of TCU, that, yeah. that we've got this, um, while we have wonderful graduate programs, the vast majority of our students are at the undergraduate level. And, um, and so we almost act like a small college with all the offerings of a larger school. Can you talk about mentorship and um, how that works and why it's important? Yeah, no, that's great. I, I'll say too, to peel back the layers on even how we hire people uh, within my department, biology. Um, it's fairly typical when you're applying for a faculty position that that you would you would come to campus and present a research seminar, and you would be part of the selection process, is looking at your research and how would you fit in. Um, what is not so common is we also have all of our faculty give a teaching seminar. So from the very beginning, um, we, we are selecting faculty that are that are totally committed to teaching and, and mentoring students um, because uh, it, it is so important. So it's it, it 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 really is diverse in terms of how that plays out within the college. Um, it it could be just um, in in some of our smaller classes where faculty have the the chance to really get to know students and through them coming by, uh, meeting with them during office hours. That's where a lot of the mentoring take pl takes place. Um, throughout our college, most advisors are faculty advisors. So the same folks you'll be seeing in the classroom is the same people who will be advising you, helping you decide what classes to take. But also, you know, if, if maybe you need to tweak to your study strategies or you're thinking about uh, getting involved in research or thinking about looking for an internship, that same faculty advisor is going to be there to, to help. Um, but mentorship uh, also in our college looks like uh, working with, with students in research. And again, that's an area that I think 
really sets our, our college apart and that around 40% uh, or so of our students will work with faculty on a research project before uh, graduating. Um, some departments, it's, it's closer to 100%. Um, but I, I think for most students that want to do it, um, it's simply a matter of, of seeking out the opportunity and you can. What that looks like is getting into the lab and really contributing um, on a science project that, that uh, uh, will advance the field in whatever area you, you're in. So students get to learn how to use, use the equipment, how to work with the primary literature, um, and most of our students will then present their research at a, uh, our internal um, uh, student research symposium some of them at uh, national and international meetings, and a few will end up uh, as co-authors on, on publications. And that's, that's actually fairly common uh, throughout our, all of our departments and really not something you see too often at, at many larger universities, just, just because the focus uh, is, it has to be on graduate students. And what you've described <laughs> is uh, what we at TCU call the teacher-scholar model. I mean, that is a framework that we, that we use here across the disciplines that our faculty members are brilliant scholars and there's an expectation that they that they that publish which is of course not uncommon at a research university but um, there is an emphasis on that critical relationship with students right yeah that's right yeah. and and you know you you hear that terminology used a lot teacher scholar and different universities to you know define it different ways um, but as someone who's, you know, I, I, I went to a small liberal arts uh, university. I actually did a master's at TCU and then a PhD at a large flagship. And I've sort of seen all the different models. Our teacher scholar model is really great in that it combines uh, all of the elements you just discussed. The, the faculty that, that end up teaching our students here, we're often teaching about things we discovered in the research lab. Um, so students sort of get the cutting edge in the class, but then uh, the benefit is they can then walk walk into our research lab and actually participate in that in that process of science. Okay, let's uh, let's get to some of the questions. Um, and uh, I appreciate all of the questions that have been posed already, and encourage folks to continue to ask. I'm going to start with a question that we actually um, solicited via Instagram ahead of our um, our time together tonight. Um, Moni asks, if you are calculus ready, do you suggest taking another calculus class before the fall? And I suspect that this might differ depending on what the intended major is, I, I guess. Like if you're studying engineering, that might be a little bit different from a student who's studying psychology. But generally speaking, uh, for students who are entering the College of Science and Engineering, what sort of math preparation do you think is required or recommended? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think um, you, you're right that you know, what is most important is going to depend a lot on, on what your major and career goals are. I can say if, you know, if you're interested in mathematics, in physics, uh, uh, in engineering, then focusing on calculus in, in terms of your high school training, I think could be important. Um, if you're already uh, calculus ready uh, and, and, you know, have met the requirements, you, you'll need to enroll in calculus when you arrive at TCU, I'm not sure an additional calculus class over the summer would be necessary. So if you've met the requirements, you should be ready to go. Um, and I'd also say for, for students in, in other areas of, of sciences, oftentimes, um, if you've had training in calculus, that's great. If you haven't, um, I don't really think you're at a disadvantage it, for biology, for psychology. Oftentimes, uh, training uh, in statistics, at least at the undergraduate level, is is what you'll need for most graduate programs. So um, a, a great foundation in math in high school can help, but I, I don't need think you need to feel like you need to get beyond um, calculus ready. Uh, it's interesting that you say that because not only have I heard you say that before, but specifically for our nursing department, which which um, just for clarification for everybody is not in our College of Science and Engineering, nursing is in the Harris College of Nursing and Health Sciences, but there may be uh, potential nursing students um, or parents of potential nursing students um, listening and watching. Um, 
our nursing department has told us statistics is one of the best classes you can take in preparation for that major. So we do hear that consistency consistently. I think a lot of um, high school students see and maybe they're advised that statistics is somehow a lesser than class. And certainly calculus is great preparation for, for a variety of, uh, of programs, but, um, but statistics is, is not a throwaway class. And by the way, having taken it at uh, the undergraduate and graduate, graduate level personally is not an easy class. Um, mm -hmm. it's not, you're not just sitting there um, creating, you know, trying to figure out the mean and the median of a bunch of numbers. It, it's it's I appreciate you saying that it's very practical uh, if, if you're going into science if you're going into medicine um, you will use statistics every day um, you know calculus sort of depends on what your field is uh, there are many many areas of science where it's not commonly uh, utilized so I, I couldn't agree with you more and um, uh, getting some exposure to that and, and sort of understanding why it's important even before you come to university, uh, I think would be great for everyone. Okay, Melina asks, do you accept spring semester transfers with over 60 credit hours uh, and with an associate's uh, degree in science? So I'll, I'll, I can answer that yes, we do take spring semester transfers every year. And just to put some uh, numbers behind this, every year university-wide, we enroll about 400 transfer students in the fall semester and about 150 to 175 in the spring semester. Um, Matt, I, I guess I, I'd love to know from you how the process for transfer students work, transferring into the college, because um, sometimes it's, it's fine if you have 60 credit hours, it's great that you have an associate's degree, Not um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be able to graduate two years uh, with just two years from TCU just because you already have two years. Credits um, have to line up with our core curriculum and major requirements and so forth. So what's your experience been perhaps advising um, transfer students? Yeah, I, I think that's uh, um, that's a good point. And some, yeah, something transfer students have to keep in mind is uh, two things. One, our, um, our coursework, our curriculum is highly sequenced um, in, in most areas within the college in that you're gonna take some, uh, you know, introductory type coursework, then then maybe some sort of mid-level uh, science coursework, and it's all building on to those upper-level, junior, senior-level courses. Um, and sometimes the, the science uh, coursework or training they, they come in may not align perfectly with uh, what, what we're going to be delivering to them during those introductory courses. So um, sometimes uh, any transfer student is going to meet with uh, an advisor, and they uh, – who's a specialist in the department they're coming into. And sometimes that, that uh, advisor may recommend uh, that they uh, maybe go back uh, and take a, a course again uh, or another introductory course. So that's a common recommendation, often just to make sure they really have that firm foundation so that they can succeed in the upper level classes. And um, depends on the department, but you know if they do well, sometimes then there's opportunities to sort of skip skip ahead. And the other piece of this that's really important to understand is these science courses in in all of our departments are quite quite rigorous. Um, and so sometimes uh, students come in, uh, they've they've completed uh, lots of coursework, maybe not science coursework, and uh, want to focus exclusively on science. Um, and they'll often hear from an, an advisor that may not be the the, um, the best choice because it's it, it, once you start taking more than two, three science classes at a time, it gets really difficult to um, uh, to manage. So our typical recommendation for everyone is that you know no more than two or three science classes at a time. Um, and so that could mean that you you know even though you've you've completed a lot of credits that you may still be having to buffer some of those science courses with non-science electives. Um, so that being said, I think transfer students sometimes are at a real advantage in that they've got a lot of hours coming in, uh, which provides them some cushion uh, if they need to take a little bit lighter course load or drop a class. Um, it, it also, you know, they obviously have come in with some study skills and some maturity. That can be a, a, a great advantage. Um, but I, I do think it's important to know that it doesn't always really reduce 
the amount of time dramatically. Usually, um, um, certainly not by, by two years or even three years, what some students uh, hope for when they transfer in. I'm going to ask another uh, transfer-related question. Hannah asks, asks, I'm currently doing my associate's degree while in high school, and I'll have a total of 60 credit hours that will transfer. Uh, or Will I be classified as a freshman still or a junior? And I can answer that, and that is, um, well, sort of both. Um, from an academic standing standpoint, you'll have a certain number of credits that you have amassed. And as Dr. Chumchal just described, um, that will um, help inform how many credits you still have to go. So you will come in with advanced standing of some kind. Um, however, from a residential standpoint, because you're coming straight from high school, you'll, you're treated residentially as a first year student. So our students are required to live on campus for two years. So you would still live on campus for two years, even if you had 60 credits coming in and, and from an academic standpoint, maybe a, a, a second or third year student. So I hope that, hope that helps. Okay, I wanna pause here for a second. Matt, um, if you've seen our uh, Facebook Lives before, you know that we have a tradition of, uh, of pausing periodically for dad jokes. And so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna pose a question to you. And I figured in honor of you being a, a, a biologist, I'm gonna, I, I came up with one or I, I found one that is, um, well, zoology is a subset of biology. So this is somewhat uh, related. Okay, so here, here goes. What did the orca mm. say to his valentine? Mm. What did the orca say to his valentine? Wow. I'm, I'm looking for killer or uh, whale. Or, or, yes, yes, so you're yeah, on the right track. Oh, man, I don't know. Give it to me. Will you be mine? Oh, boy. <laughs> Worse yeah. than I thought. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, giving, I'm giving you partial credit for that. Yeah, so, okay. All right. Okay. okay. Good, good job. I got the pun at least. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lily asks, do you have to apply to pre-health and able to get into that area, or do you just apply to TCU as a whole? Um, and Matt, can you describe the difference between um, pre-health being a track versus having a major at TCU? Because the answer, Lily, to your question is you apply to the university and select an intended major. But how does this track work alongside a major? Yeah, that's great. So... Um, as Heath is alluding to, we are not a major, um, and I may not have said that directly. Um, we're, we're really an academic enhancing program. We're here to provide advising, to provide help with getting ready to interview, to provide um, opportunities to shadow physicians, um, and a lot of other things. Uh, but every student who's pre-health is also going to select a major. So, um, there's uh, before I describe them this, those majors, I do want to say one thing, and, and that is anybody who raises their hand and says I am pre-health, we're here for you and are going to help and support you. So that's also a, something that's a little different than some other universities. We don't have a GPA requirement, we don't have a standardized test score requirement. Uh, anyone who wants our assistance gets it and is is pre-health. So Lily, um, if as soon as you enter the university, if you want to be pre-health, you, you would be. Uh, in terms of majors, um, again, many there are many you know majors that will work with pre-health. There's not one specific area you have to focus on. Uh, like we mentioned at the outset of the show, uh, most of the prerequisites that our uh, pre-med, pre-dent, pre-vet, et cetera, students are going to take are science prerequisites. Um, and those professional schools want to see, um, uh, you know, uh, um, some, some pretty strong training in the sciences. So oftentimes it's efficient um, and or to the student's advantage to major within a traditional science. That's what most of our students do. But um, the truth is, as long as you can complete those science prerequisites and let um, uh, demonstrate to a professional school that, that you have good science training, you can major in, in just about anything within the university. Uh, there are some majors where, you know, that, that, that the sort of combination with pre-health is, is, is not ideal because of um, uh, a variety of, of sort of requirements and scheduling difficulties, but 
uh, most things work and um, we've got students every year majoring in and almost anything you can think of throughout the university. Yeah, I, I always use, I always say that's like, remember Elle Woods in Legally Blonde? You know, she went on to, to Harvard Law School having majored in, in fashion. And and you you really could, you could major in, in anything uh, at more or less at the undergraduate level here and still and still pair that with pre health. It might limit the flexibility you have with some of your elective classes, right? Um, but but it certainly can be done. Now let me, uh, I'll, let me since we're talking about this, give you one sort of myth that we hear a lot. So um, when you're deciding what you you should major in, I, I I really think you need to follow your interest, your passion, your aptitude, and select your, your major, you know, from, from that list. What I wouldn't recommend is choosing a major you think is going to look good. Um, because ultimately, you know, you have to do the work, you have to be happy with this. And if, and if this is an area you're passionate about, whatever it is, whether it's science or non-science, then I think you're going to be more successful. I see some bad advice on the internet, Reddit and other places that, you know, most students who go to professional school major in the sciences. So to set yourself apart, major outside of the science. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I, you got to think about this from the other direction. Most students are majoring in the sciences because that works so well um, and is so efficient. And most people interested in professional school really enjoy the sciences. Um, so if, if that's you, you should embrace it and it major in the sciences. If you've got a passion for history, uh, English, Spanish, whatever it may be, major in that, and we can work with you about, uh, working in those science prerequisites, but don't do it just because you think it sounds good. Yeah, that's, it's a great point. I mean, occasionally you'll have conversations with students. We'll have conversations with students and they'll say, I really want to be a doctor, but yeah, I hate science. And it's like, oh, well, that's, you, you, you might want to think about an alternate career then, because that's if you hate science, this probably is not the thing you want to go into. That's correct. I mean, you're uh, not only, uh, even if you're majoring outside of the sciences, you're going to have to uh, take those science prerequisite courses. Um, you're going to have to to take the uh, MCAT, which is, um, boy, um, 60, 70 percent basic science in terms of its focus. Uh, and then, you know, your uh, your first several years of professional school and uh, uh, in a direct basic science way are going to focus on the sciences and then it'll be applied science from there on out. So, yes, I, I would agree. If, if science is the problem, then uh, there are other ways you can uh, be in a helping profession, even be in a healthcare profession that doesn't have the same focus on mm -hmm. science that medicine does. OK, Matt, Kristen asks. What sort of research projects have your students been involved in? What year does that normally happen? Do freshmen conduct research projects? That, okay, those are all great questions. Um, generically, I'll just say um, for most departments, then yes, first year students could be involved in research if they wanted to. Oftentimes our advice is that, um, you know, that first year is so important, getting your feet under you academically, socially, uh, et cetera, that our advice is, is, is typically to make sure that process is fully underway before making the commitment to research. But we've definitely had students that have engaged in research as early as the first year. I'd say most students um, towards the end of the sophomore year, summer of sophomore year is, is often when it begins. Um, but like I said, could happen earlier. The, the projects are going to be dependent on the department that that student, you know, typically associates with and the faculty that, that they end up working with. So this ranges from doing, you know, research on deep space, if you're in physics and astronomy, to materials, um, to biophysics and engineering, to nutrition, uh, chemistry, uh, all areas of biology. My my work is on mercury contamination of the environment, and I have students catching spiders um, and other critters, looking at mercury levels in them. So um, a whole range of things. And I would say um, to, to all the students listening, thinking about research, um, my advice would be 
definitely to find a, a, a mentor and a potential project that that you connect with that that you find meaningful because again you've got to invest your your time in it um, but then on the other hand at this level at the undergraduate level what's really important in my opinion is that you're learning the process of science um, and you can do that in in just about any lab um, and by the process of science I mean learning to ask questions, learning to work with the primary literature, learning to collect data in a way that is um, ethical and a way that is uh, repeatable, um, learning to write, learning to communicate. All those things are, are more important, I think, than the specific project you might, you might be working on. Um, and when it comes to eventually you know, moving into graduate school or professional school, those are the skills I think most advisors uh, and professional schools are looking for, uh, not the, the specific project per se. So if you have the opportunity um, to work with a great mentor, um, even if it's not the exact area you, you think you may uh, ultimately want to end up in, I think you can still um, learn a whole lot. Okay, so Matt, that, that answer prompted several questions in, in my head uh, and also segues nicely to a question that Daphne asks, um, because you were just talking about sort of that, those basic building blocks that are necessary to, to have a career in science. So Daphne asks, do undergraduate students have an opportunity to participate in clinical research or are most of the opportunities considered bench research studies? Yeah, that's great. Um, I'd say most are doing bench research. Um, and so again, most of the, the, the faculty in our departments are, um, are going to primarily be focused on bench research or field research, um, and we do have a few though that that and and this is something that students are open uh, or, or uh, we we can help facilitate that will go work with our faculty at the medical school or faculty really in other cities uh, that are doing clinical research, um, and they can you know do that and it sort of counts in terms of their application to graduate and professional school. Uh, but most of them are going to be focused on bench research here. I would say, uh, again, though, what's, what's critical is that you get those basic science skills. Um, and if you have the opportunity to, to work on a clinical project, fantastic. But if not, it, it doesn't really put people at a disadvantage. I've got two students um, that are both alumni of our program um, who are nearing the end of their residency or recently finished their residency. Um, both of them, um, one of the important differentiators that they felt like in terms of uh, their residency program, which of course is what's happening after medical school, was the, the undergraduate research that they did, and, or at least the history of research from undergraduate to medical school. Neither of those um, did, um, neither of those did, uh, uh, clinical research at the undergraduate level, but they got those skills they needed to then uh, help them at the medical and, and uh, residency level. And, and Matt, uh, you and I have talked about this before, but I'm curious, I think other people will find this curious. Um, you know, we're talking about in the college, helping to build student skill set for beyond TCU. What are the skills you think are particularly valuable or what are the traits that you can identify that would suggest a student is going to be successful in these areas? Like, are, are there any discernible patterns that you've been able to, to, um, to observe that says, okay, here's a student who's likely to succeed based on having traits X, Y, or Z? Yeah, I, I do think, you know, some, some, a, a good foundation and training in, 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 a sci in science disciplines in high school is of course very helpful because when you get to, to TCU or any other university, you're gonna hit the ground running with some really fast paced, intense science content. So getting a good background in those areas is important. Um, but I would say uh, there's a lot of other types of skills that, that sometimes aren't necessarily associated with scientists that are, that are absolutely critical. Um, some of those would be, um, and, and the one thing I can point to that when I meet with students, um, 
that, that really tends to pretend success is, are you a reader? Um, and I think there's a lot that's, that goes into that. That's a correlate with things, but, but do you enjoy learning things on your own? Um, how's your reading comprehension skills? Do you practice that a lot? Um, are you really curious? I think all those things go into that question. How much do you read? So if, if, if you are, are really thinking about the sciences, a future in healthcare, I'd, I'd make it a practice if you don't already to, um, to really start reading. Um, and that can be novels uh, that have nothing to do with any of these topics we're talking about. They can be, um, they can be nonfiction pieces, magazine articles, um, doesn't really matter, but I would, I would definitely get in a habit of sort of reading and, and practicing those comprehension skills and thinking critically about what you're reading. Because whether you're studying on your own in a class, getting ready for a test, reading a primary literature article, um, those are the skills you're, you're really going to need. So I would definitely um, encourage everybody that's listening to, to, to practice those, those areas. Excellent. Okay, um, we have a couple of questions that are related specifically to pre-med classes. Um, uh, and so I'm gonna start with Ethan's question, which is what are some initial pre-med classes you would take as a freshman sophomore? So in your first couple of years, what are classes that, that a pre-med advisor is going to have a student take re regardless of major? Yep. So you're going to start with um, introductory courses in um, biology. You'll start with introductory courses in uh, chemistry. Um, that, that, that would be a general, general chemistry course. Um, you'll do some introductory physics um, and organic uh, chemistry. So those that, that I've sort of rattled off are going to mostly happen during your first year and, and sophomore year. Um, and then as you transition into junior, senior years, you'll start focusing on biomedically oriented classes that will prepare you for the uh, standardized exams you'll have to take for the MCAT or the DAT if you're, you're a pre dent student, um, and then ultimately get you ready for, for medical school or dental school. And then Navina, who's joining us from YouTube, asks, what is the class size for pre-med students? So in these classes that you're describing that you're going to be taking initially, what's, what does a class look like? Yeah, so typically uh, what you'll experience during the first year and sophomore year are some larger class sizes, um, somewhere around um, typically 100 students. Uh, the lab sections are going to be quite a bit smaller, typically around 24 students. And then as you move into your junior and senior year, just depending on the class, those are going to be quite a bit smaller and range from, um, you know, sometimes 12 students up to um, 30, 40 students in, in some of our more popular biomedically uh, oriented classes. Um, and I think that the, the class sizes are large, but I would say, and, and if any of you have a the opportunity to visit campus, you ask our students, and uh, um, I think they'll verify this, that I, I think we do, a, we work pretty hard to make those uh, class experiences feel smaller than they actually are. So the faculty that teach those classes, uh, you're going to find um, are available during office hours in such a way that you really can get to know them in a in a one-on-one -on -one, uh, or a small group uh, to faculty setting. Uh, and like I said, in addition to earlier in the show, uh, in addition to the faculty that are teaching your classes, you'll have um, a number of pre-health advisors who are here for you to, to talk about um, not only how to apply to professional school, but how to study, how to sort of make your way through some of these classes. So even though they are uh, a bit larger during the first and, and second year, I think you'll find there's there's lots of opportunity to get to know those faculty. Okay, a um, couple of questions having to do with ad, ad, advising. Um, so I'm gonna start with, Moni asks a question, do engineering incoming freshmen need to know which classes to sign up for during orientation? And I guess I, I would just 
broaden that to any incoming student. Like, how does that process work? How does a student even know what to what classes to register for? Yes. So I will first, uh, we're in orientation season right now, uh, and perhaps the person asking the question is is going through this now. Um, I, I would say that it's overwhelming, and, and I, um, I, I, I would admit that, that uh, or at least uh, sympathize with you there. You're coming into college. Um, you, you've got to make these decisions, but yet you haven't, you haven't even set foot on campus yet. Um, and I want to reassure everybody that uh, throughout the college, we're going to have advisors that are going to work with you and make sure you know exactly what courses you need to be taking. So um, throughout uh, all of our departments, there's typically going to be an introductory class or two within the sciences you'd be selecting, and then some uh, uh, elective courses uh, or core classes that uh, are uh, the types of classes that every incoming student at TCU would take and eventually have to complete prior to graduation. So uh, even though you, you may not have a good sense of that coming in, we're going to work with you throughout that orientation period to make sure you know exactly what to take. You'll leave orientation with a schedule. Um, and we're here throughout the summer. So if something just doesn't quite feel right, um, you can always reach back out and, and we can help you um, either feel better about it or help you make a switch. So um, I'm going to ask a, a question, or well, Sophia is asking this question, which is also about advising. How will TCU advisors help if a student starts down the path of the sciences, healthcare, but decide they don't want to follow that path anymore? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, and the truth is, I think all of us are committed to helping our students get get wherever they want to be. So um, if, if that, for me, if, if I work with students going to medical school, if you get to the point where you decide that's not the path you want to go down, that's actually great with me because ultimately I want students to find what is the best fit for them. So um, that's something our, our advisors will help with. Um, and so we will uh, make sure you get to another college, another specialist advisor who can help you um, in whatever area you want to transition into if you know what it is. If you, you know, if you decide, yeah, I came in interested in the sciences. I don't think this is the best fit for me, but I'm not sure where to go next. Um, then we can help with that transition as well. And so we've got a great career center, um, which is often a place we, we start with for students to kind of delve into their interests. Um, and that can sometimes help. Uh, within our college, uh, we have a career center representative who actually teaches a class on, um, you know, finding different careers within the sciences and also just generically, what are your interests? So there's a number of tools we can use as advisors to help students transition to other areas of the university. Um, and that's something we, we think is just as an important part of our job is helping students who stay within the sciences. So we're, we'll be here to help with that. Wonderful. Okay. It is time for another dad joke. All right. Okay. Take a deep breath. You can do this. Um, it's also, uh, it falls under the uh, zoological sciences and there's an mm -hmm. academic bent to it. So this really should be right up your alley. Perfect. What subject in school do cattle like the most? What subject in school do cattle? Uh, they don't like, they like movies. But they that, do. That's not that, That's in their free time, maybe. Yes, that's good. That's good. Um, oh, oh, man, boy. You, you're, on, you're on the right track, though. Maybe Muthmatics or... You're not, you're not that close. Cudulous? Yeah, well... Uh, yeah. Uh, calculus. Calculus. <laughs> We might have to invite you back. Yeah. <laughs> I'm learning to okay. give out awards for anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, Suchi asks, what is the percentage of TCU pre-health students that get accepted into medical school? I saw on the TCU website that the number is 80%, but I wasn't sure if that number includes PA and dental schools. So maybe you can parse out, you know, med school versus other professional schools if you have that data. Yes. So we typically report uh, medical school data, and that's the 80% number you're seeing. 
Um, and the reason for that is that is uh, most of our students are headed to medical school so that the sample size is quite large there. And that's typical at TCU and at, at really every other university in the nation that we are dominated by medical uh, students interested in medical school. So in a given year, our um, acceptance rate to medical school is 80% or higher. Um, it's often in the high, high 80s. Um, for the other um, professions, which uh, we, we don't report um, on the website typically. For for vets, uh, it's it's a hundred percent for the past several years. Um, we and so we have fewer students applying to veterinary school. Again, that's fairly typical um, in in terms of pre health programs. But uh, but every one of them that that has applied, two or three a year, has gotten in past several years. Uh, for dental school, it would be um, 88%, like you're seeing on the screen, for medical school or higher in a given year. Again, most of our dental students uh, um, get in. Uh, PA school is a number that's a little bit harder to track down um, just because of the nature of PA admissions, uh, when people apply, how they engage our committee. Um, so I I, I can't give you as precise of a number, but I'd say it's it's equivalent to, to the 80% number we frequently cite for medical school. And um, I, I know that that, as the graphic indicated, is a, is a pretty high percentage. Um, and we're not a school that manipulates those numbers. I mean, there are some colleges that will sort of um, only allow, only officially endorse certain students to inflate their numbers. And, and that's that's not what we do. But what is it? What's the special sauce with our with our pre health professions institute? If you if you don't mind tooting your own horn for a second, what do you yeah. think it is that we're doing that allows our students to be so successful? I I, I really think um, it it comes down to uh, the access to advising uh, and mentorship that the students have in the program. So nationally, the acceptance rate is about forty percent. Um, and as you say, uh, some universities will only support students with a you know, very high GPA, very high MCAT, met certain other thresholds, and they report you know, around 100% acceptance rate. That, that's usually because they've cooked the, the numbers a little bit. Um, I'll, so it, it, to talk more about that support, we start during our first year with a seminar for all three health students where we're going to talk talk uh, and learn about um, all the resources we offer to our students, how to access those. And those range from clinical shadowing programs um, to volunteer programs to um, research offered by uh, our partner departments and faculty. Um, but we also talk about, you know, really thinking about why are you doing this? What are your goals? What's motivating you? Um, how do you stay the course? Uh, you know, when you're when you feel like you're ready to throw in the towel, how do you learn new study habits? So we'll start that, you know, during the first year. Like I said, we remain with our students in terms of advising throughout all four years um, and uh, have dro a, a, a drop in advising system such that every day of the week there's a faculty advisor available. Uh, and so if a student ever has a question, you can get those those questions answered. And then we sort of cap it uh, all off with a, uh, an experience during uh, the junior or senior year where students take a three hour class that's really all about how to put together uh, an application and prepare for that, that process to be successful. So um, we will uh, you know, provide all the information you need to write a personal statement, talk about how to reflect on your experiences, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So when it's time to apply, you really know what you're doing and, and know if, if you're ready to be successful or maybe you should wait a year or two prior to applying. Um, and, and then can you talk about that, that team letter um, yeah. that, that's written on, on behalf of the student? That it's, it's not just your favorite faculty. Like you really right. get, ex it's everyone you've been exposed to, right? I mean, more yeah, less. and I think that's really uh, the, the sort of beauty of TCU's model and that we have what we call our health professions advisory committee and most universities with a serious pre-health program will have the same committee. 
Ours is large, uh, typically around 20 faculty. These are the same faculty that are gonna teach you in all those prerequisite science courses and, and the upper level classes as well. They're the faculty that will be your advisors. They're the faculty that will be your research mentors. And so when it's time for you to apply, the same faculty will give you a mock interview or practice interview. They'll read all your application materials. So we, we come to a point where we really know each other. Um, we, we know you, you'll know, if not everyone on the committee, several people on the committee well. Um, and so that allows us to write a really, um, I think, meaningful uh, and authoritative letter where we can put your academic um, accomplishments into context. But more importantly, we can talk about your, your character, uh, what, what, what we think makes you tick, um, how we observe you interacting with other people. And those are all things that the professional schools are really interested in. Um, and so I think that's something we can offer the students and, and we get a lot of positive feedback from the professional schools on sort of the in-depth nature of those, of those letters. Um, Stephanie asks, uh, and it's related to this, what's the average number of TCU students who apply to medical school each year? Uh, that's good. So we have uh, somewhere around 100 students apply to all of the health professions a year, medical, dent, PA, et cetera. And about uh, 60, 70 of those will be um, pre-med students applying to medical school. Okay. Stacy asks, I have two sons, one interested in psychiatry and one in veterinary medicine. Is there an undergraduate degree you would recommend for each of those uh, boys? That's good. Um, so for those of uh, in the audience that, that don't know, of course, psychiatry is a field within medicine. Um, and so uh, someone interested in psychiatry would be pre-med. Um, and so for both psychiatry and veterinary medicine, um, in terms of academics, uh, it's, the key is going to be getting a lot of, of science uh, training, a good background in science. So a traditional science major like biology or chemistry works fantastic, even neuroscience, which is in, within our, um, our psychology department. Those all work really well. They'll, they'll check all the prerequisite boxes and get, get uh, a lot of the upper level science uh, coursework taken care of. Um, but like we've talked about earlier, uh, if, if there's other areas of interest, um, then those can be pursued even outside of the sciences as long as you uh, take advantage of our science prerequisite courses. So oftentimes, um, and most of our, I would say, our, our veterinary medicine students, our medical students, they major in biology. Um, and the reason is, is by majoring in biology, you, you complete most of the prereqs you need without too many additional courses and, um, and complete a degree. So it tends to be a very efficient path, but there's a lot of, a lot of uh, paths that would work with both those areas. Great. Stephanie asks, do you apply directly to your major? If yes, which majors are more competitive as to acceptance rates? And then what are the most popular majors for pre-med students? So I'll, I'll take the first couple of questions um, and, um, and we can revisit your part of it. Um, so the answer, Stephanie, is when a student applies to TCU, they're applying to the university as a whole and our office of admission is going to review them um, irrespective of major choice. On the application, we're going to ask what the intended major is. And based on the response to that question, we will funnel the student into the appropriate college upon enrollment at the university. So if a student on the application says, I'd like to major in psychology, they're gonna start in the College of Science and Engineering. If a student wants to study um, you know, strategic communication, they'll be in the Bob Schieffer College of Communications and, and, and so forth. Um, typically, um, the standard for admission is the same because we don't want 17 and 18 year olds to believe they have to know what they wanna do with the rest of their lives. It's really developmentally inappropriate. Um, it's okay to come to college not knowing what you wanna do and to change your mind. And our curriculum is really flexible and designed to allow students to do just that. There are some exceptions. Nursing is probably the best exception because it is a four year lockstep program. If you don't start in nursing in the first semester, you, you won't be able to graduate um, 
in, in, four, uh, in four years. Now, some majors are more popular than other majors. So, um, so it, it could be a little more competitive, but that will just depend on the applicant year. Um, as each application or each applicant pool is a little bit different from one another. Business is always really popular at TCU, but we have a lot of space in the business school. So it's not like the acceptance rate is really that far out of, um, out of step with the other majors. Similarly, the College of Science and Engineering is the second largest TCU college. So there are a lot of students who are st studying in the College of Science and Engineering. Um, we have a lot of students who apply and then a lot of students who are admitted and, and, and therefore uh, enrolled. What I will say is the College of Science and Engineering um, on average uh, attracts a slightly higher caliber of student. So one out of every um, three students in the Honors College is in the College of Science and Engineering. And 40% of our Chancellor Scholars, which is our top academic scholarship, are students in the College of Science and Engineering. So um, even though the admit rate might be a little bit similar, it is a slightly more competitive pool um, to to get into that uh, to get into one of those majors. But again, we're not talking about huge differences because we want students to be able to change their uh, change their minds. Now, as to the question of popular majors for pre med students, Matt, I know we've talked about this in the past, uh, not on here, but but personally, and we know that uh, you mentioned a few of them: biology, chemistry, neuroscience biochemistry, those are really common. Are there other majors that you would say are super popular or does it sort of, are, are those the four that really stand out? Uh, those would be the four, yeah. Biology, chemistry, and biochemistry, neuroscience, by far and away uh, our most popular major. Um, typically, if a student is majoring outside of the sciences, they tend, tend to choose a liberal arts major. Those pair really well with with uh, some of the, either as a double major, uh, a science major or um, minoring in a science, um, and reflects the fact that, that uh, frankly, medicine is more than, than science. Uh, uh, so there is a real need uh, to, um, uh, as, a, as a, someone wanting to apply to professional school, develop your, your inter and intra personal skills, to, to develop your cultural competence, and oftentimes majors um, outside of um, the College of Science and Engineering in a place like um, Adrad College of Liberal Arts are fantastic for that. So we see a fair number of those majors. Business is uh, uh, somewhat common, um, and this will be a good seg. Uh, sometimes the problem with a major like business is that a student has to understand, although that may be a great major uh, for someone who wants to go into uh, you know, dentistry, for example, and own their own practice someday, uh, to complete the prerequisites plus um, the business courses sometimes means that that student will take a gap year or have a growth year between graduation and matriculation to professional school. So if, if they're okay with that, then oftentimes these more exotic combinations work, work well. Um, and I said it, it's a seg because I do want to say that I have, because I have the audience, um, and I, I think it's important for, for everyone at this stage considering professional school, both students and their parents, to understand there is a trend uh, uh, amongst medical schools that the, most students are now taking a gap year, meaning um, there's a year between graduating from undergraduate and matriculating to medical school or PA school, uh, et cetera. Um, that is, you know, there's a lot of things going on there. Uh, of course, the uh, competitive nature of professional school is, is really important. There are way more applicants than there are seats. Um, but it's also, um, a result of the fact that professional school admissions are becoming a lot more holistic. That, you know, great, good grades, good standardized test scores, those are necessary but not sufficient uh, when it comes to applying to professional school. And some of these other skills, the inner, interpersonal, intrapersonal skills that oftentimes can develop as a result of working for a year or two post-graduation, those are the things that professional schools are, are really valuing. So um, I think it's important to know and think about from the 
from the outset that that's oftentimes part of a successful application is waiting a year or two post-graduation before applying. That is an excellent way to, uh, to end our time together. Um, so thank you so much. I do have one last question. That is, it is now seven o'clock central time. What are you doing for dinner? What's on the, what's on the menu at, at home? That is great. We are going to uh, some uh, friend's house for dinner. So um, I, it is up to them. But we're bringing dessert, which is peach cobbler that I just picked up Ooh. from Fairfield, Texas. Um, and so I'm excited to dig into that. How about you? Uh, well, my wife and my daughters are out of the house this evening. So it's just my son and me. So we're doing breakfast for dinner. It's pancakes at the Einstein very, household. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Matt Chumchal, thank you so much. This has been a blast. The hour flew by. Um, I hope we can do it again sometime. To everyone who has joined us, Thank you as always. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions. Um, we're gonna take uh, July off for our summer hiatus and we will be back in August for another Facebook Live. So have a great evening, everybody.